Okay, good morning. So let's start. If you like. My name is Patrick Cordier. I'm from the University of Lille in France, and uh, I'm in charge of presenting you the second part of the rheology following all this foul lecture and more focus on transport properties, uh, well, how we, we can go to, to, to the deformation. So I would start from, from here for those who were not here last week. We had this presentation. I don't remember exactly whether it was uh, Michael Buffett or Bruce Munger. It's too dark to, to see actually. But uh, anyway, uh, he was introducing the, the, the equations about geodynamics, and we saw we had to conserve momentum, mass, and so on. But at some point, we had to introduce matter. We had to introduce a material that was concerned. And while well, usually the simplest form might be like that, having the heritage of fluid mechanics, but more generally, we need to introduce something that we call constitutive equations. Constitutive equations are everything that you need stress, strain, maybe the time derivative, mat constants of the material, whatever you like to, to describe the flow. We, we have seen with Dan Shim what kind of equation we need when we are dealing with just compression. And we've seen that that's not easy. Compression equation of state is dealing on how you compress the bonds, basically, in a solid. Here, we flow. We are dealing with the same kind of purpose, but we deal with how we break the bonds, how we go for irreversible flow in, in the matter. So this is what we have to, to do. And also, maybe it's worth to realize that we have to deal with a fluid which might not be read like that, but which might be also something like that, something like a crystal. And this is something, of course, that we need to, to take into account and to describe. And I will spend a lot of time to try to, to reconcile on the one hand, crystallography, which is order, and flow, which is disorder, and see how we do, how we do that. We've seen that also a couple of times, just to remind us that the interior of the Earth is very far and that we cannot go inside the Earth. Uh, how do we do that from the perspective of rheology? Well, uh, we just don't need to bring matter at high pressure, high temperature, but we also need, when we are sitting there, to apply a deviatoric stress, to get deformation, to, the, to measure the strain, and so on. So this is an additional uh, complexity for experimental rheology. But we have a few tools that, well, are not meant from that, but can be used also for that purpose, or that are specially developed, like the DDI or the rotational deformation apparatus here, which have been specially designed to provide information on these uh, mechanical properties. And well, we, we made a lot of progress, and we say we, we it's a community, it's not myself, but uh, we made a lot of progress because, uh, you know, like uh, five, ten years ago, I would not have been able to present you results like that. Uh, this is dealing with wozleite at pressure like 15, 17 GPA, something like that. Now we do have some information about the mechanical properties. What is that? We have the stress at a given strain rate, and we have that as a function of temperature. So this is the usual way we, we plot those data. What do we see? We see that it's pretty strong. You know, uh, we are dealing here with stresses which are of the order of the GPA, which is significant. Uh, I've been working previously on the mechanical properties of ceramics. You know, the strongest ceramic that we had at high temperature was partially stabilized the cornea at 1400 C. It was 700 MPa, and it was so strong that I had no piston to deform it. So I had to use the same material as a piston because there was nothing stronger. Uh, here we are dealing with much higher uh, stresses. This is ringwoodite. Ringwoodite, we had some previous data at room temperature in the diamond and set that we can compare with data at higher temperature. It's interesting. You see that, of course, uh, temperature helps and decreases the, the stress which are necessary to, to deform the material. Still, we remain in this field. And last but not least, uh, a few months ago, we had the first result from Carato's group on the plastic deformation of a 
an aggregate of magnesovustite and bridgmanite, and we have a few points. There are more in the paper. We've just plotted those at lower strain that we will compare later with our results, and we have also some data at room temperature. So, well, this is, uh, this is a real improvement. This is very important to have that, but uh, then we need to, to, to go further. And the big question is to, to understand, well, these stresses are high, but how do they transpose when we don't deform, I forgot to, 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 to write here the strain rate and the minus five, but when we, we bring that at, uh, at lower strain rate. So we need to have constitutive equations. How do we do that? How do we build constitutive equations? Well, you have a ask uh, an expert. This is the expert. In French, we say that uh, il faut battre le fer tant qu'il est chaud. We need to forge iron when it's hot. So this guy, a blacksmith, he knows that he needs fire. And usually blacksmiths are like strong guys, you know. So this means that if you build a constitutive equation, you will put here an Arrhenius term which will describe the thermally activated process. And well, stress you need, so you will write this power law equation with a stress exponent, five, three, whatever you like, which tells you that you need to apply stress to, to do plastic deformation. So this is basically what we have. Oh, you need pressure. OK, so let's play with, uh, with Q and let's add a PV term to, to, to the activation energy. Is, that, is there a theory behind that? No, the question has been asked on the, on the stress exponent. No, there is no theory behind that. So if you go to a meeting and you see a guessing, well, my stress exponent is 3.2 compared to 3. What it, you can take a nap. Uh, it's just, you know, apparent coefficients. They are useful because this is an efficient way to describe our data. When you have your, your data, basically you, you apply stress, you have a strain rate, or you impose a strain rate, you measure a stress, whatever you like. So then you, you plot that into a log-log plot. Log-log plot are fantastic. You know, we have all those flags of, with the, the Nobel Prizes. I think that so the person who deserves the Nobel Prize is really the one who presented the log-log plot because basically everything becomes more or less consistent. You have a straight line. Well, that's important. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's do that. And this is the way we, we use to, to present and to discuss our data. And those parameters are useful to compare what we have. The difficulty comes when we want then to extrapolate and to say, well, OK, this is what we have in this range of strain rate. How do we transport that to, to natural condition? And that's more complicated because you have to go all the way along the Earth. It's uh, probably even. And since, you know, this is not relying on a strong theoretical background, this is definitely a difficulty, and this is something we need to keep in mind. Or then you can put whatever you like, grain size, water, foo food dust, you know. <laughs> so it makes things even more, even more complicated. So you see, I put here just proportional to. So those constitutive equations have been, but it's just a way to add parameters. But again, you know, there is no description of what would be the actual uh, implication of such or such parameter in, you know, except in small cases, which I will describe. But I will come back on that. How could we do experiments which go toward that direction? You know, this is probably, as far as I know, the slowest experiment that exists on rheology. This is done on this kind of bitumen. Uh, I don't know if it's true, but this is what I read, that this guy has been looking at this experiment during 52 years. So every, like, 15 years, a drop is falling. You write a paper. <laughs> then you live peacefully, waiting the next one. You know, I don't know. But, uh, so, uh, but look at that. You know, this is 10 to the 11. We need something like 10 to the 21. So it's really something that is very difficult and I would say impossible to reach. Uh, who said that? Uh, it was that I think things we can do before we die. You know, uh, this is really, really an issue here. This is not a cider project. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, this is not something you're going to do in two or four weeks. Forget about that. Okay. What if? Well, we can dream a little bit. I, as far as I know, this is the oldest mechanical experiment that I have found. This is a beam bending, a classical test in solid state mechanics, which was only proposed by Galilei. 
So what if we take uh, a time machine, if we meet uh, Galilei, and we say, well, could you set an experiment for us? And then we come back now, like four centuries later, and if we want to, 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 to see what is the deformation during four centuries at this strain rate, well, it's only 100 nanometers shortening for 10 centimeter sample. I would assume that Galileo was not able to deal with nano samples, you know, so let's suppose that he would take that, no complaint. That's at the limit of what we can measure, basically, especially after four centuries, you know. So, so really, you see that this is something that we cannot do experimentally. So we need to find another way to do that. And so we can propose another approach, which starts from a, a theoretical approach, saying, well, let's do like Descartes, you know, before the cogito. He said, well, let's wipe out the table. I want to forget everything I learned, everything I know. I start from scratch, and I build up, and then cogito ego sum. So let's do the same, except that we will not throw out everything. We will keep the theoretical books. Theory is important. We will, take the, we will keep the theory, but let's start from the crystal structure and let's see if we can understand mechanisms and build up scale and end up with rheology. So this is Bridgmanite. On Saturday morning, Dan proposed that kind of exercise. He was showing Perovskite, and Dan is a nice person, so he invited you to brief and relax. I'm more of a bad guy, so... <laughs> What I would like you to do today is to stress the structure until it yields. You know, this is what we're going to do today, so uh, we will relax later at the, at the coffee break. But uh, for now, we will stress the structure. Not you, but, uh, but the structure if you can. So this is what we're going to do. And basically, the difficulty and the problem that we have is, I said it, I repeat, uh, it's to reconcile crystallography, which is ordering and flow. You know, flowing water is not a problem. It's a disordered medium, so you start from a disordered configuration. You go from another disordered configuration to another disordered configuration. There is no fundamental problem with that, you know. But here we have a crystal structure. It's ordered, and we know that after plastic deformation, if we X-ray the material, it's still crystalline. So we need to preserve crystal ordering during plastic deformation. How do we do that? There are several ways, and Uli presented us one of them. The most delicate one is just to say, well, let's do it atom by atom. It's transporting matter. So we take some atom somewhere, and very uh, delicately, we put it at an equivalent position in the other direction. If we do that, well, we will remove matter here, bring it here, and we will deform. We can take it from the side, put it here. We can make plastic deformation by just moving matter atom by atom. This is diffusion, atomic diffusion. For that, we need a mechanism, vacancy, to have some empty space so that you can put your atoms, and so on and so on. We heard about that. This has been set very elegantly. If, if you read those papers, this is an extremely elegant model. It's not complicated, just guidelines, the ideas. Nabarro proposed the way to couple stress and chemical potential, how the stress would change the vacancy concentration close to a surface. And then Herring set up, uh, well, you barely see the arrows, but set up uh, an elegant way to, 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 to put that into shear, and then uh, working the, the flux, which result from this disequilibrium, we, we have this uh, constitutive equation which you can invert, and then we agree with our colleagues from uh, fluid mechanics that we have some uh, equations for which stress is proportional to strain rate, and that we can call a viscosity, there is no problem. What is extremely important is to realize that there is a dependence on the grain size here, but this one comes from a calculation, from a model. You know. So this brings after to say, well, let's put uh, a grain size with some exponent to try to generalize, but the, the, it might be more complicated, actually. You know. But here, it's quite simple. Uh, and it's important to, to realize this uh, grain size. And uh, that is something that has always been a, a problem to me, especially for the deep earth, because, and this is a, a a test that has been made recently in this paper by Glisovich and Forti. Uh, well, if you want to, to, to account for what we think might be the viscosity inside the Earth, what kind of grain size do we need since we have ideas about the diffusion coefficient? You know? 
And the constraint is pretty strong. And for me, it's pretty strong. It means that the granite size has to be of the order of a millimeter. So that's not big. I mean, so if you, your planet is not able to evacuate heat if the grain size is greater than a millimeter, it is, to me, it is a problem. And having that adjust uh, a parameter is, uh, well, it's an hypothesis, but the Earth might not care about, uh, about that, and the grain might grow, and what does happen? So, so to me, there was really a need to, to go further that and to find other, uh, other mechanisms. The other way to deform a crystal is not to transport matter, but really to shear it. And again, the problem is to reconcile crystal ordering with this operation of shearing. So this is something that we can do, and this is something that we can calculate quite accurately at the atomic scale. So basically, uh, we take a simulation cell in which we put a couple of uh, unit cells. That's, uh, that's enough. And then we have to test some specific planes to apply shear. And what we do is that we have the supercell, we apply a given vector, shear vector, in a given plane, we let the atom relax a little bit, and we calculate the excess energy which is associated with this process. So this is a way to map the energy which is associated with shear and to find for easy shear paths. And that's very important, that works. And uh, this is an example here, which is done on ringwoodite at 20 GPF. This is something that I want to, to highlight. I will not go into technical details today for several reasons, including time. But uh, here, since those calculations can be done on supercells, which are reasonably small, we can really do that with DFT. So this is where, in fact, we introduce pressure. So pressure is not added as a term, as a corrective term. It's really taking into account how the bonds stiffen with pressure. So this is a very important point that, uh, well, will be more or less transparent in my presentation. But let's do it. This is ringwoodite. Here we are testing uh, one of those planes. And you see here that this is the energy in joule per square meter. And you see that, well, if you do anything, you have very high energy. Well, it's very unlikely that doesn't work. This direction here, it's not favorable. But we can find some specific directions in some specific planes where it's easiest to shear a crystal. And here, this is a lattice repeat. So this means that when you did that, you end up with a crystal which is as perfect as the crystal you had before. Yep. So in, in this, my understanding of how crystals <laughs> deform by shear is by propagation of dislocations, defects. And I'm curious if... Oh, so I have to introduce defects? If, yes, if you've included ah. the defects in the model and if the defect preferential, you know, the dislocation motion is always along the easiest, the low shear modulus path. If I had only 20 minutes, I would have been in trouble, but I have an hour and a half, so I will then introduce these locations. <laughs> but it's, it's definitely a way to, to find this kind of easy path. Then there are some corrections, and I will show you how we introduce the corrections. But at this point, at this point, I am ignoring the concept of dislocation, and I will show you where I see that I have a problem. But still, uh, I, it brings some information. And we can see that, for instance, in ringwoodite, whatever the, the easy plane that you find, the easiest shear direction is always along this vector, half 110, which is one of the ladies repeat in this, uh, in this structure. And well, you see that two planes are more easy, 110 and uh, 111. One is more difficult, 001. So we'll focus on that later. And this is a guide for us to look where we may find the dislocations. You know? Patrick, could you perhaps introduce briefly the notations, you know, the brackets and the Oh, OK. Listener? So in, uh, yes. In crystallography, a direction 
is written like that. Since we have some symmetries, you have several directions which might be equivalent. So in that case, you write within those to say, well, here, these are all the UVW direction which are equivalent, like in cubic 100001. For the planes, we have the same kind of story. If we are speaking about one specific plane, HKL, we put like that into parentheses. And if we take all the planes which are equivalent, what does it mean equivalent? Basically, it's the same day HKL, the same interplanar spacing. So in that case, we use this kind of notation. Okay. And when, uh, when I think about it, which one is it, this one? Ah, okay. Uh, when I will think about it, I will also try to, to help by putting UVW for direction and HKL for planes. But it just. But before you move on, can I just mm. quickly ask, can you say something briefly about how these curves are constructed? Are these sort of theoretical or. Exactly. Are they it's measured it's or a purely theoretical, theoretical concept and it's made like that. You know, It's made by taking the crystal structure, you apply step by step, so you mesh your plane, you apply a vector inside the plane, then you impose this displacement in the plane. You let the, the displacement perpendicular to the plane free to relax. You relax the structure and you, you calculate the converged energy. It's a purely theoretical concept. This is not something that you can measure. Okay. But it's a, a useful guide to find the possible dislocation in a structure. And it's also an ingredient for one of the models I will not present, but the Pyrrhus Navarro model is one of the ingredients that we can put into a model to, to calculate dislocations. OK, I will make a few stops during this presentation. Um, can I just uh, ask you about how to read this diagram? So uh, is it right that? Uh, the x-axis is the angstrom, so distance, right? Yes. So this is um, the displacement along that direction. Right. So yeah, if you go to the next slide, the 2D is way easier for me to understand. So if you move by one angstrom, the energy of the system goes up because you displace the atoms out of the location. And then finally, when you move by five or more angstroms, because it docks into the Next or equivalent position. Structure nicely that the energy goes back to lowest. So during the move from one place to the other, energy goes up and then it goes down. Is that the picture yes. that I have to draw? Yes. Except yeah. that we don't that we don't do that dynamically. We do right. that static. You know? Right. But you can take more about that. What you can see is that if you if you have the crystal here, of course I, I said I impose the shift in the plane. So right. if you would not do that, it would come back because you have here. Right. Right. Okay. It falls but back. But here into the it's windows. difficult. It's different. You see, here there is a local minimum. Right. So this is what we call a stacking fault. Got it. So this is also a way to identify a stacking fault into a crystal structure. Got it. Just a quick follow-up on what you said about uh, you do this statically. Can you give us a sense of the time scales for how long it takes for the lattice to rearrange itself and kind oh. of relax compared to? No. OK. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, you know, basically all those, all those stacking falls, um, I, I, I cannot tell you why, but practically, you know, you have 90 of the points which you can relax easily, and you have always 10 points for which you have problems uh, to, to get the good relaxation. So in that case, you go along the way, you take the position before to go step by step to it. So, uh, but what these are calculations which are a few hours. Or no, no, I mean, how long does the crystal lattice itself take to? In, in, I guess I'm trying to understand how physically? important. Yeah, physically. No, no answer. This is a okay. theoretical concept. Okay. okay. So the, the only time constraint that we have is the time to reach the, the converged energy in the calculation. Okay. Okay. I understand. This is not something that we do physically. Otherwise, you know, we uh, we are at a scale uh, which is uh, less than the picosecond because these are things that you can model by molecular dynamics. But this is not how we do that. OK, so as I said, I will make a few stops to see, well, what are the good points, what are the bad points, where are we, what did we learn? So, uh, so far, we learned 
already a very important uh, concept in plasticity, which is slip system. Slip system, it's a family of planes and a family of directions. Those directions have to be within the plane. You know, we have some constraints, so it's shear, it's only shear. And uh, uh, this is the concept that has been introduced very early by Schmidt and Boas. This is the year of the book in English, but I think that the first publication uh, was in the late 20s or early 30s, something, something like that. Uh, and they were observing that in some uh, metallic wires called whiskers. We, we had these experiments. These, you cannot read the scale. Probably this is one micron, like uh, three micron and 10 microns. So these are very small uh, pillars that has been deformed. And we do see exactly the same, that indeed, if you want to shear a crystal structure, it does occur along some specific planes and along some specific directions, slip systems. And this is something that I could leave to Rudy Van for tomorrow, because basically with that, you can describe the kinematic of plastic deformation. And very important things like anisotropy and so on can be derived from this concept alone without so far the need to have the dislocations. You know. For the kinematic, we don't need. But, but we don't understand stress. And if we try to, to normalize, to have an idea, we have some, we, so we divide by an elastic constant like the shear modulus, it's, a, it's 0 0.2, 0 0.3. Okay, you would say, well, that's ring would die at high pressure, but you do that with aluminum of copper, you have the same kind of answer that you have stresses which are much, much higher. And this is where I meet your, your question. It means that this is not the actual process if we want to describe the dynamics. But we do describe the kinetics, you know, so, so the kinematics, so it's, uh, it's not too bad. But we need defect, and uh, Uli Faul already told us about that. And in the present case, what I'm trying to introduce is dislocations. Dislocations have been introduced very early by this gentleman, Vito Volterra, who was an Italian mathematician. He didn't care about plastic deformation. He was asking very fundamental questions. Is it possible to have a source for internal stresses in matter? And he was trying to invent some topological defects that he called distorsioni. And uh, there were a bunch of them, and some of them uh, became famous when, in the 30s, these three gentlemen, Orovan, Taylor, and Polanyi, uh, proposed the concept of crystal deformation as agent for plastic deformation. And that was a very seminal discovery, and uh, as uh, we had some discussion, I, I've always been puzzled that uh, uh, this has not been awarded the Nobel Prize because so, so, so many implications actually in physics and in engineering and, and whatever. But in any case, uh, these are dislocations. Let me show you some. You all already had some, some nice pictures from, uh, from Uli. This is basically the, the idea. This is the process. You know, the dislocation can glide into a specific plane. And the idea behind this location is that you're not just like brutally breaking all the bonds at once, but you uh, share, you, you do that bond after bond. You localize plastic shear, and then you propagate plastic shear. This is why this is a transport property, actually. So this is the idea behind this location. So those lines, uh, they move uh, into the crystal, and this is how you do, uh, you do the plasticity. These locations are quite complex defects, quite complex objects, and basically they are like light. You know, light you cannot describe with one theory. Sometimes it behaves like waves, sometimes it behaves as a quantum of energy, and you need both approach depending on the observation that you need to, to, to describe. This is the same. If you look at a dislocation far from it into the crystal, linear elasticity is enough to describe it quite well. The dislocation is the source of a displacement field, of a deformation field, and a stress field. The shape is quite complicated, but what you can just leave from this slide is that, you know, the, the stress field, for instance, is like a complex distribution in space, but it's, it's scaled to mu b. b is a Burgers vector. It's the displacement left after the dislocation. We call that the Burgers vector. And uh, important is that it's 1 over r. It means that it's a long-range interaction. It's see that there is no cutoff 
all dislocation in the crystal, we see all of the dislocation. It's a highly nonlinear, complex problem. And this is why it's been a nightmare for physicists for, for many, many years. Another consequence of that is that when you go to the near field, when you go near the dislocation to the core of the dislocation, then, of course, you have a problem because all the fields, they diverge, and you cannot describe what's going on in the dislocation. This is the reason why Volterra was clever enough to, to draw hollow cylinders so that you remove what causes problems. Of course, we have to go further. It means that you have to leave uh, continuum mechanics, we have to leave elasticity, and we have to go for atomic scale description of what's actually going on on the dislocation line. So this is always what we have to do, exactly like in light, we have to go back and forth between two different kind of concepts to be able to have a full accurate description of the behavior of those uh, defects. These dislocations are beautiful or ugly, I guess, depending on your And they will be nicer later. Yeah. And are you saying that the reason they're so convoluted and complicated is they interact with each other? Because they don't look like planes, for example, in any kind of regular cr crystal lattice. What do you mean? Right. If you go back to the cartoon, maybe it's a little easier for me to ask my question. Ah, here. The picture on the left, you'd expect all your dislocations. Oh, yes, so of course you see a plane here. This is a plane where it glides. But in the picture, they're wiggly worms. Uh, here, uh, uh, yeah, this is a complicated uh, structure. <laughs> yeah, uh, I will not show that, but uh, here's the dislocation that jumping from one plane to another. And you cannot see that. Uh, you're, you're right that this is not the best example to, to restate the concept of planes. <laughs> what controls the time scale for propagations of dislocations? I will come back on that it's because it's... Uh, it's a, it's a huge it's a huge question. Um, I will try to, to remind, to raise a flag when it will come to mobility, <coughs> because this is the whole story. But first, you know, before I have to understand why they move, this is the first point. So if you if you take a dislocation represented by this symbol here, you put it into a medium. The dislocation is characterized by the Burgers vector, the amount of shear that is transported by the dislocation, and the line vector because it's a line defect, okay? If you now r load your medium, whatever you do, that is, in other words, you plunge the dislocation into a stress field, what is important is to realize that since there is a displacement field associated with the dislocation, and since there is a stress field here, they can couple, and the dislocation will respond to stress. And this is what is extremely important. And this is, you know, what we, what is brought more than crystallography. Here we can have what we call the peach and color force, which said that the line direction, the Burgers vector, couple with the st applied stress tensor and give a force. And then the question is yours. The question is that uh, there is a velocity of the dislocation, and that will tell the transport. Simple question, let's just ask as physicists. Uh, if we say that the dislocation is uh, an elastic perturbation, what it is, there is a, a uh, displacement field. Okay. So then we do exactly as you did, Steve Grant. We write Navier equation, and you enter this strain field in the Navier equation, and since I would do the same as you, I would get the same answer. The velocity of the dislocations would be the sum of speed. Okay, so let's keep that, for instance. Question is then, and, and we store that, we, I will come back on this point. We store that, and uh, we, we can already give an idea about how to go. Let's assume that we have this velocity. We don't yet, but let's assume we have it. How do we go from the behavior of an elementary defect to a collective behavior? And this is a, a really difficult task. We have now these kind of tools, which are very difficult, but we can put into a box a lot of lines and calculate. I don't know if you can see here the tiny line. Uh, we can calculate the response of the stress to the applied stress and to the stress of all other dislocations. This is extremely computer intensive. This is not well parallelized. But well, we, we are starting to, to do that. Uh, usually we, we go for a more simple description like 2.5D. We say 2.5D because it's 2D basically, but we introduce local rules to reproduce the behavior that we would calculate at 3D. 
or the easiest way is to is to go for Orovan equation, and I will use uh, Orovan equation uh, mostly uh, today. Orovan equation is something that you can understand very well because uh, Orovan equation is just like Ohm's law. You know, Ohm's law, the uh, density of current, is the product of the number of carriers, the charge, elementary charge. That I don't know if you can see, but you know, well, maybe I should. And, and the velocity of the dislocations. This is uh, basically here the Ohm's law. So here we have the equivalent. It's, it's not the uh, density of current, the strain rate that we end up with. It's not the number of dislocations because these are line defects. So we introduce the dislocation density. The dislocation density is the total length of dislocation in a given volume. So a dislocation density would be like uh, length in a length square, so it's given in units which are per meter square, uh, but it describes the length of defect into a crystal structure, and that would be the velocity, assuming that we know it. But if we do that, then we have a way to go from the elementary properties of a dislocation to a collective behavior, and I will I will come back uh, I will come back on that. But let's come back to this issue on velocity. Can we measure something? There has not been many studies on the mobility of dislocation, but we did, and I love this, uh, this experiment, so I would like to show it to you. We did this experiment where we deformed in situ olivine in the TEM. For that, you have to use a tiny, tiny sample, which is smaller than a red blood cell. And if you do that, you can achieve plastic deformation at room temperature with olivine. We have this device. This is a scale, a human hair. So we have this device, which is put into this three millimeter space here in this sample holder, which goes into a TEM, where uh, we can glue this tiny sample of olivine. And if we push here with a nano indenter, we open this gap and we s deform this sample in tension. So this is what we have. I don't know. I hope you can see. You have loops like that, which expand. Maybe it's better on the movie. So you're really looking at plate tectonics, you know, olivine being deformed under your eyes, you see a dislocation loop which expands. This is like one micron across. We apply hmm? colors. the colors, it's just the diffraction contrast. So you forget about that. You just have to, to focus. This is because the specimen is a little bit bent, so you have bright contour. But you just have to concentrate on the loops. These are the dislocation which are here. Otherwise, it's black and white. No, it's room temperature. We cannot heat so far. We apply here like 300 micronewtons, which is 1.1 GPA, <laughs> you know, uh, force over uh, area. And uh, what is good is that we can measure velocities. And this is what we have. We see that the velocity depends on stress. This is at constant temperature. We would have another complicated dependence on temperature. But you can see that basically the velocities are like a few uh, or a few tens of nanometer per second. We are very, very far from the sound of spin. And this is the basic idea. You know, there are a lot of lattice friction. You need to understand uh, the motion of dislocation as viscous motion. So uh, the intrinsic Velocity means nothing. And the whole kinetics, and here I come back to your question, the whole kinetics is to understand what are the frictions which are opposed to the motion of dislocation. Dislocation have, uh, do not have an easy life. You know, they are paid to make plastic deformation, but they are hampered by many, many things. So we have so many problems. So we will try to describe a, 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 few, a few problems. To see if I understand this, so this is 50 nanometers per second is the propagation velocity, and so in 20 seconds it would go one nanometer or one micron. So that was approximately real time then. Approximately, the, the the movie was a little bit compressed, so it is, you would not make a measurement, but it was not accelerated. Yes. Okay. Mm. You could not make a measurement here because I suppressed a few measures to to decrease the size of the movie, but. Uh, Patrick, mm. does most of the reduction in velocity from the ideal sound speed velocity, does it happen because of interactions with other dislocations? Or Depends. If you speak about aluminum, that is the case. 
if you speak about ceramics or minerals, uh, this is what I will describe later, the interaction with the actual lattice which is the dominant uh, process. But it really depends, you know. If you, if you take your hardened alumina, uh, aluminum, it's it because you introduce precipitates. You know, this is the whole uh, process of engineering after to, to introduce things to hardened materials. But in, in our case, it's the lattice, and I will show that. So just like electrical resistivity, where we talk about, you know, perfect, you know, electron flow, and then the resistivity increases because of scattering. Yes, here it's not scattering, it's breaking bonds. Okay. But it's, it's intrinsic. I totally love this, but this curve reminds me of the subcritical cracks, and then when you grow, the speed also grows when it reaches the critical cracks. So. Do you imagine that once you have this location pile up, the tip is actually going to, uh, uh, the speed going exponentially up? Pay, pay attention, this location pile up, then we would describe a collective behavior. This yeah. is an intrinsic behavior, but uh, it's, it's, a little bit, uh, it's a little bit more complicated. We don't know much about uh, the, the, complete, the complete velocity law. You know, uh, as I said, basically, if you take the velocity as a function of stress, for instance. Let's take these parameters, and this is what we have. The maximum would be the, the speed of sound, so this is the maximum. Somewhere at low stress, we think that it's kind of linear, something like that. The few measurements that were made by Gilman in the 50s were showing an intermediate stage, which is kind of linear, like that. So the best we can imagine is something uh, roughly like that, you know, but uh, uh, we don't have any complete descriptions in, even in metals, you know, you can take aluminum or, or so on, so, so this is something which is not, not touch more. Then, uh, if you would introduce other defects, you know, that would be different, so. Remember MG2SIO4, right? There is not, no. Uh, this one is San Carlos, but uh, you know at room temperature you would not see any difference. Uh, at this stress level, you know, iron you go through, so. But that was San Carlos. You could not see because it's not red, but uh, this is black and white. Uh, I, I should skip things now. So uh, let's, um, let's go to another point. You know, we, we've seen that there are difficulties. Let's ask ourselves, can we calculate that? You know, can we model this location? Can we calculate the velocities? So the answer is yes, and this is quite, quite recent progress. So we can uh, make actual simulations. So we need to build a supercell in which we have to put a dislocation. But then the problem becomes more complex uh, because of the size, as you can see here. It's not because it's 20 atoms per unit cell. This is a dislocation. The dislocation would lie perpendicular to that direction since the system is fully periodic along the dislocation line. This can be extremely thin. One lattice repeat is enough, so that is no problem. But here, remember that we have this stress field, which is 1 over r, which means that whatever the size <coughs> of the system you take, all the atoms will feel a little bit of the strain field. So if we, have, if we want to have a converged calculations, we need to have big cells, like a few tens of thousands of atoms. Consequence is that we cannot do that by DFT. We have to use empirical potential. We have to validate them. OK, I'm not going to discuss the details of that, but this is a real issue, and we need to spend time to, to, to do that properly. That, that is a problem. This is the reason why we did overcome this problem for many years using other models like Payot Saint Barreau. Now we can do that with a few systems, and this is what I will present today. OK, I'm going fast on that. We can discuss more about, uh, but it's just not to let you think that these are easy things, uh, easy things to do. There are some specific uh, complications. But let's just enjoy the, the results. So we can model here, for instance, a 100, this is a Burgers vector, uh, dislocation in Bridgmanite at, at, three, at uh, 30 GPA. You see that here the crystal is not like everywhere else. If we plot the strain profile across the dislocation, this is what you would get. If you take the derivative, we call that the density of Burgers vector, and this is a convenient description 
of the dislocation to see, for instance, the width of the uh, defect that is not easy to appreciate on this kind of figure. So now we can do that for several, several dislocations. Since I'm running out of time, I will just run the dislocation gallery, which is nice, as you anticipated, Michael. Thank you very much. So we have sometimes complicated structures like that for wood light, for instance, where we see that we do half of the shear, then we have a stacking fault. You remember this minimum that we could see in the GSF in the gamma surface. We see it by a stacking fault, then the other one. And this is what we do see at the TEM, uh, that was uh, the work of Eli Naturel. When we look at dislocation, actual dislocation in what's light, we do see this structure. This has important implications because when a dislocation likes to split a little bit into a plane, then it provides an additional constraint to say that the dislocation will glide into this plane and also the friction will be reduced. The more it spreads, the faster it can go. So it's also something, you know, these are details at the atomic scale. You could say, why the hell, we don't care. But no, in fact, it has huge implications on the mechanical properties and I will show you that. This is another one in Wadsleyite. Okay, this is a gallery. I will not spend a lot of time on that, but just to show you that now we can do that, and that has been a lot of time and a lot of work to, to go for that. This one is nice, and uh, I will, you barely see it. I think you may not see it. It's only the small planes here. If you would count, you would see that there is one more here than here, just a little bending. This is very lucid dislocation. So, Patrick, you introduced these. Um, this is a gallery of... Defects. Synthetic defects, mm. right? You introduce them mm. into your computer model. Yes, okay. yes. Oh. And I will show you how I make them move afterwards. Okay, I will come back on this uh, elusive dislocation, which has interesting properties. Let's make another stop. We're happy because now these are not unknown defects. We know those defects. We can model them. We can characterize some of their static properties, but uh, still we have the question of the velocity. But before I will address the velocity, I will try to see, well, what is the friction opposed to their motion? That is the first point. But then I would like to know how they move when I apply stress, what is their velocity, how it depends on stress, temperature, blah, blah, blah. You know, this is, uh, this is the whole story. First thing to do is the brutal force. We take the box where we put the dislocation and we shear the box until it does something. What does it do? We, we, we shear the box, we calculate the energy, we see that we have a parabolic increase, which means that we are just storing elastic energy, no problem. But at some point, the system which contains the dislocation becomes unstable, and zoop, the dislocation starts to move. So we have here a measurement of the friction that the lattice opposes to the glide of the dislocation. And it's quite significant, it's 4.5 GPA. We can Look that from above now and see how the dislocation is moving from one position to the other. This is the more uh, sophisticated version of the small drawing I was showing previously. You see that you don't make a big damage. You just reorganize a few bonds, and that's enough to propagate the dislocation into the crystal. We can follow uh, how the dislocation does that. You, you, we can plot the profile of the dislocation as a function of the motion. So we can really understand what are the processes which are associated with dislocation glide. We have another way which is less brutal to do that. We can actually calculate the potential barrier which the dislocation has to overcome during light. So we call that the piles potential. At rest, the dislocation will sit into a low energy position. And if we apply stress, it will go from one to other. The pile stress I was describing is the derivative, the maximum slope of that potential, okay, so the pile stress is one measurement of this, uh, of this potential. We can calculate it, we have the nudge elastic band, which means that we calculate all intermediate position, looking for the minimum energy path, the most clever way to go from one stable configuration to another stable configuration. So this is what we can do, these are two examples for two dislocation in Bridgmanite, calculated by, uh, by Anton Kresch. And uh, here again, more accurately, I would say, we are really uh, able to see the details. You know, here it moves as a block. Here the two peaks, one goes first, the other one is running after it afterwards. That changes a little bit the stress. You, we have to discuss 
that level of details to really understand what is the lattice friction which is opposed. But then we have a measurement. We have a, we have a value. So this is where we are at this point. Uh, we have made some progress. You know, we, we know the defects. We know the agents of deformation. And we have a mechanical data which is, of course, far away from the experimental data since it's without temperature. So we would say this is a stress at 0K. This doesn't mean anything. We don't do deformation at 0K. But if we want to compare, so hopefully we see that it's higher. The trend is correct. Even here with Ringwoodite, where we see that we are above the room temperature measurement and above the high temperature measurements. With Ridgemanite, since it's stable of a wide range of pressure, we can even do that as a function of pressure. And that's very interesting. And we see that pressure does harden very much this material. We start from a level which is respectable, 5 GPA, but we end up with like 10 uh, or 15 GPA at the base of the mantle for, for, these, uh, for these dislocations. But we can have surprises. Surprises come. You remember this elusive dislocation you barely saw. This one, it just glides very easily. And when we go from the perovskite to the post perovskite, boom, it drops. It drops all of a sudden. And we have the, the propagation, the friction, which is opposed to this dislocation, which is very, very low in this uh, layer of the post perovskite structure. I will come back on that. So this is the first stop. We know the intrinsic resistance. That's good. We would like now to bridge this measurement at 0K to high temperature measurement. So this is what we need to introduce, the influence of temperature. The easy idea would be, oh, OK, let's just shake the atoms. You know, we need temperature. Let's just shake the box, use molecular dynamics. We should not do that. Why? Because the dislocation line is a lot of atoms. So you cannot expect to have all of them at once who decide all of a sudden to jump into the next position. You would wait for, for, for ends. That would never work. So this is not how it works. You need to find some mechanism. And what are the mechanisms? The name is the king pair mechanism. By vibrating the dislocation, we'll be able to send a, a small loop above the Payol's barrier. And there is a critical configuration beyond which it goes very rapidly to the next position. So the whole job that we have is to calculate and identify this critical configuration, and then to calculate the critical enthalpy of this configuration. This is the energy barrier of the minimum energy path for a dislocation going from one position to another. If we make the calculation, you know, for what's light, it's 100 picoseconds, a characteristic time to wait for that. This is not something you can get in molecular dynamics. And from the top of my head, for, for perovskite, it's close to one second or something like that. So this is not, we call that rare events, which means that this is not something you can sample into a, a molecular dynamics calculation. So we need to, to, to describe the, the energetical landscape and to try and pass reaction paths to understand how it works. So it's a little bit more complicated. Uh, I will not. Uh, especially you now, go in much detail about that, but we can calculate those critical configurations. This is one example in perovskite. We can calculate this enthalpy, and uh, these are parameters we can use. I will skip that. I have another version which is uh, more clear later. Well, just just to, to say that we can build an expression of the velocity with these parameters, but I will come back on that in a more elegant way later. I would just like here to emphasize the consequences of that. Since we have ideas now about the velocity, I, I did plot here three velocities for olivine, uh, ringwoodite, and, and perovskite, and bridgemanite. Just using olivine as a kind of a reference, because we think we know olivine. We know that if we deform olivine in the lab at 1,600 uh, degrees, 1,600 K, well, it's ductile. We can do it. This is within the experimental field. Well, we see that we can have the same kind of velocity, so the same kind of ductility for ringwoodite, for instance. But see, because of the slopes, we would have to go to over 1 GPA. If you remember, that are the stresses found experimentally. And we understand why here from the microscopic scale. And this is the same for the bridgemanite. You know, we can get the same kind of ductility as olivine, but we need to go close to 2 GPA. So we really see that this lattice friction is responsible to the stress level that we saw previously. But I will do that more uh, in a more 
better way uh, later on. Let me show you how, uh, and this is in a, in a paper which uh, is uh, uh, in revision actually uh, by, by Antoine Kresch. Let's come back to the Orovan equation here that I introduced uh, earlier. Since we have now this expression of the velocity which is here, uh, we can do something. What's important is that we did calculate the evolution of the activation enthalpy as a function of stress. We calculate it mostly at low stress, but we can uh, fit it along the, the whole range here using those parameters. This is also something we can calculate. This is the energy of a single kink. This is this point here, or divided by two actually. So basically, we can introduce that into that, into that, and then we can invert the expression. And what is nice is that here we can calculate the stress as a function of temperature, but what do we need actually? We need three sets of parameters that we all are able to calculate at the atomic scale. This is the pile stress. I showed you how we did calculate it. This is here this curve. I briefly told you that we can calculate it and these parameters as well. So from a few calculations, a few dedicated calculations at the atomic scale, we can inform this equation and uh, calculate the stress as a function of temperature. We have this C factor which gathers a few parameters. Look at that, the strain rate is here. The strain rate is not anymore something we have to extrapolate to. It's a parameter that is in the equation. So we can set what we like. We don't have to extrapolate, so this is cool. So let's do that, and now let's make a, a more accurate comparison with the experiments, you know. So this is what occurs with, what, with ringwoodite. Uh, <coughs> small detail, but uh, the difficulty that what we calculate is, in fact, the local stress I would say in the plane of the dislocation. Let's see, this is a dislocation. I calculate the local stress projected into the plane. When we have experimental data, this is the external force which is here. So we have to project the force somehow to make the correspondence. So let's say there's a factor of two, which is the maximum of the Schmidt factor, and we can compare orders of magnitude. This is what makes the difference of this CRSS. This is the resolved shear stress, which is a projected stress into the plane, and the engineering stress would be the applied stress. Okay, just a factor of two to, to help comparison. I will show you how we can do a little bit better later, but that's enough to, to, to see that basically we can account quite well for, for the, the mechanical behavior and the level of stress that we observed in Ringwoodite, that we observed in Wadsleyite. Look at that. You see those two slip systems, they have very different behavior, very different slopes. This is because of this dissociation, of this splitting of the core. So you see that some tiny details at the atomic scale have profound implication on the mechanical behavior. So this is extremely important. When we see kinks in the red and blue curves, are those caused by phase transitions? Oh, you know, here? That doesn't look like exponents. P no, it, it's because... Uh, that's not, when you have a dissociated... I, I described the kink pair mechanism. It's easy for a single line. When you have a split it into two lines, then you have to describe a more complex king pair mechanism. There are two mechanisms. One possibility that you nucleate simultaneously a kink on both dislocations. The other possibility that you make one and then the next one, or the other one and then the next one. And the two mechanisms do operate depending on the stress, and this is uh, the, the difference between those two regimes. Well, we have to deal with that, but uh, at the end, it uh, doesn't make a, a huge difference, but uh, this is what, what's hidden behind. You know, I, I could not go into all those um, descriptions. Um, Bridgmanite, Bridgmanite as well, uh, we could make the same, and we see that, uh, again, we very well describe the level of stresses. So this really means that those stresses that we do observe on those high pressure phases is due to a very strong increase of lattice friction. I have reported here the first time we did apply this approach was an MGO by the PhD physics of Jonathan Modeo, and we can see that we also reproduce quite well the contrast in mechanical <coughs> properties between MGO and Bridgmanite uh, from our calculations. Stop. Where do we are? We 
quite happy because now we can have ideas, we can model the individual behavior of phases, uh, but that's not an aggregate, and that was a difficulty to compare experiments made on aggregate and or measurements which are more local. Can we go the next scale? Yes, a little bit. This is work in progress. We just started, by the way, this is not our expertise, so this is something that we do in collaboration with Olivier Castelno and Catel Derrien. But then it's the field of uh, polycrystalline plasticity. There are several tools, viscoplastic self-consistent modeling. I think that Rudy Venk will speak about that tomorrow. Uh, we used it a little bit. The other one is finite element modeling, which is, I would say, more visual to, to show you where we build an aggregate, we mesh the aggregate, we give or behavior to each grain with different orientation, and we see how it behaves at the scale of the grain. For instance, we can see the distribution of strain, of stress, or whatever you like. We did that a little bit. Uh, this, is, uh, this may move a little bit uh, in the future. These are not completely converged calculations, but uh, not surprisingly, you know, of course, we fall close to, to the curve that we had. But here, it's more easy to compare because we are speaking about the same stress. So this is something we can do. I don't have much to show you because this is something that we are just starting since we just produced the other law. But this is something that we can do and that we will do certainly. Then it's possible also to mix phase and so on. And so on. I don't have anything to show so far. Stop five. So we are happy because we can model and reproduce experimental data at laboratory strain rate 10 to the minus five. But we are super happy because we can also do the same kind of calculation at the strain rate of the mantle because it's an internal parameter of the model. It's not an extrapolation. So what do we have? Of course, the stress is reduced because, well, we have more time. So those mechanisms, they have more time to occur. So it's not necessary to push so much on the dislocation. We can just trade uh, time with uh, uh, stress. And in that case, we reduce, but, but not that much. Huh? As you can see, we still have a few, uh, a few hundreds of, uh, of MPA for Wardsleyite. The same for ringwoodite. This one is easier, but in a crystal, you need to activate uh, uh, other mechanisms. So we, we can expect a behavior which is somewhere in between. This is what we showed uh, previously. Let's go to, to, to the perovskite. At 30 GPA, the stress is already uh, quite high here, not so much. We keep, we keep the contrast between MGO and the Bridgmanite, but if we go uh, as soon as we get 60 GPA, you know, we have very strong hardening of the material, and then we, we reach stresses which are extremely, extremely high, and especially compared to MGO. Still, you remember the post-perovskite, this small dislocation. So now, it's very weak. You, we lose lattice friction at only 500 K. So then in that case, it's just interaction between defects that will control the stress at a much lower level. And we see that it's even weaker than MGO. I'm sorry, uh, yellow is not a good idea. Uh, it's even weaker than MGO at 100 GPA. So, so you know, MGO would be a, a little bit stronger than that uh, at the same pressure as the post perovskite So we really have a phase which is really weak in the plane of the layering. So. Glide is obviously extremely difficult in most of those high pressure phases, which raises some question about dislocation creep, so diffusion creep. But wait a minute, I told you that we should forget about what we had before, so let's go one step further. We have modeled one mechanism, glide, but there are other mechanisms, like climb. What is climb? Climb is the interaction between point defect and dislocation. You know, it's not two separate worlds with different mechanisms, but they can play together. If you have point defects which diffuse to the dislocation, if the dislocation absorb one vacancy, for instance, the extra half plane will jump one step. So this is a way for a dislocation to escape its glide plane. The dislocation will gain an additional mobility, which is controlled by other agents like point defects. 
We can calculate also, if we have theoretical uh, descriptions of that, the velocity which is associated with this process. Of course, that will be controlled by the diffusion coefficient of the slowest species which is involved in this rain of point defect on the dislocation line. So we do have this velocity. So we have an additional mechanism. We have an additional velocity. So what does happen when both play together? This is what is actually dislocation creep, you know, the, the interaction between both. We have now two mechanisms with two different time scale, two different kinetics. We must compare to see what does happen. A good way to do that is to build maps. This is exactly the, the same approach as you do with your A-dimensional parameters. You know, in your equation, you have different terms. You want to weigh the respective importance of those. Here, we have two mechanisms. So this is uh, one kind of uh, A-dimensional parameter, uh, just comparing the respective efficiency of two mechanisms. This is olivine, always taken as a reference. And you see that in olivine, glide is always much faster than climb. Whatever the condition of stress or temperature that I consider here, I always have like three, four, five orders of magnitude faster for glide compared to climb. OK, but they play together. And what does happen? So this is something also that we started to do. This is a modeling that has been done by Francesca Boioli. And the details are published in this paper here in Physical Review. So we, we took the 2.5 dislocation dynamics. And we gave the dislocation those two possibilities, gliding and climbing. But what is nice with modeling that you can play with the mechanism. So first, you can say, well, you're not allowed to climb. Just glide and see what happens. So we start with this configuration. We apply stress. The dislocation, they start to move. They all interact together. You know, this is the background color is a stress field. Just to remind you that we calculate the applied stress that we impose, but also all the internal stresses by all many body problem, you know by all the other dislocations. If we have only glide, they do move happily, but then they meet another one, they lock, they lock, they lock, they lock. And at the end, you know, nothing happens. The system is basically frozen at the stress of only 40 GPA. If we would apply more stress, we would, could do it. But here, it's constant stress. This is creep. But we can activate climb. If we can activate climb, some dislocation will start to climb, annihilate, and then we can go further, and we have this nice steady state. And then we can do exactly as very experimentalists do. It's important still to, to, to understand what's going on. Again, the beauty of modeling, we can identify what they do, actually. In blue, we have the total strain produced by all dislocation. In green, you have the contribution of glide. In red, the contribution of climb. You see that you barely see the difference between the curves. All the strain is done by glide. But without climb, this cannot proceed. You know? uh, we have steady state. We see that from the slope. We see that from the constant dislocation density. Well, I will not go into the details. And I should go faster now. So we can do, as the experimentalist, plot the strain rate as a function of the reciprocal temperature get an activation energy, realize that it's close to diffusion, but not exactly the, the value of the diffusion. We can look for the strain rate and find something which is close to free, which is wonderful. We can go also to lower temperature and see that we have the breakdown of the power law and that we have a curvature in those curves, even in the log-log plot, and that we need to go to another uh, kind of constitutive equation with uh, uh, an exponential to describe those data. OK, this is described in this paper. This is not what I want to describe here. I want to focus on the lower mantle. So how this, does this mechanism transpose into the lower mantle? So the good thing, the good guide, is to, to make the same kind of plots for those minerals. So this ratio of the glide of the, the climb velocity here this is for olivine. This is our reference, if you like. This is for ringwoodite. This is for bridgmanite. What do we see? If we go at high stress, remember the stresses that we observed in the lab. We do see something which is the same kind of behavior where we can have glide, which is faster than climb. But it's only if we apply these high stresses that we can have glide doing the job. If we look at the mantle, we see that it's a completely different behavior than the one that we can activate in the laboratory, where here, glide 
cannot do the job, and it's only climb that can operate. It's the same and even worse for bridge manite. It's only over two GPA that actually you can recover the conventional creep behavior with glide producing deformation, but in the mantle that would be extremely different and we would have a completely different mechanism occurring. So can we describe this mechanism? Yes, this is another creep mechanism. We call that pure climb creep, where all the strain is produced by climb. So we have now dislocations which act as sources and sinks of point defects, as the grain boundary did actually in the diffusion creep. They exchange vacancy and they move only by climb. So in that case, well, it has to be a most efficient mechanism because this is basically the same kind of mechanism of diffusion creep, but we reduce the diffusion paths, you know, by exchanging inside the grain and not at the boundary of the grain. Does that work? Can we produce deformation by this mechanism? So we had to, to rebuild a little bit our model, but uh, we have to test that. So we use the same kind of model that we used to, to estimate the creep of olivin. We put the dislocation here. The dislocation now, we give them the possibility to emit or to absorb vacancy. We calculate the diffusion in between the sources and the sinks. Some emit, some absorb, they act as sources and sinks, but they move by climb and they produce some strain and we can calculate the strain which results from that. So it works. Is it efficient enough? So let's try to compare this mechanism with diffusion creep, for instance. So here we have the strain rate as a function of stress. We compared with Nabarro herring creep or with cobalt creep. Nabarro herring it diffuses inside the grain. Cobalt, it would diffuse along the grain boundaries. Small difference. Of course, to compare, it's, we need to parameterize. The um, diffusion creep depends on the grain size. So I've plotted here a range between 0.1 millimeter and 10 millimeter. For the pure climb creep, that would depend on the dislocation density, but we should focus on 10 to V8, which is the dislocation density that we can expect in the mantle. And we see that uh, it can do the job at a strain rate, which is fast enough to, 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 to describe what we, what we want. And it's always more efficient than uh, Nabarro herring or cobalt creep for good reasons. Again, we reduce the diffusion path inside the, the crystal. So this is uh, the, the mechanism that we propose for to be active in those uh, strong high pressure phases inside, uh, inside the mantle. Maybe the next uh, last stop. Uh, okay, now I think that we have much better understanding on all the processes which act inside the grains to produce plastic deformation. And we, we, we have highlighted some mechanisms that could really operate in planetary interiors. And again, this is important to, to remind that this pure climb creep is size independent. So this is a mechanism that does not depend, its efficiency does not depend on the grain size. Whatever happens to the grain size into the lower mantle, that can do the job and that can promote uh, mantle convection. So this is, uh, this is very important. Yes, this is something I, I forgot to, to say. It's a linear process. It's not necessarily linear. So uh, we have to pay attention and uh, this is something to further model to understand whether there, there, there will be a stress exponent or not. Basically, it will depend on the sensitivity of the dislocation density to, to stress. I, I know that this is a question is maybe a little bit beyond the scope of the talk. I know Rudy's going to talk about LPO and anisotropy tomorrow, but no, I wanted to... No, that's to, uh, Rudy Van Yeah, no, I know. Them. But can I just quickly ask this, this pure climb mechanism? What are the implications for LPO? I mean, does no. this form an LPO? No LPO. No LPO. Uh, Thank you. you. The, this mechanism... <laughs> we can revisit tomorrow. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's here. It's because yeah. it's diffusion. No, it's not because it's diffusion. It's because oh, dislocation... Oh, I missed it on the side. No, yet. it's because dislocation moved by climb. 
So you know, since they move by climb, yeah, okay. uh, they don't induce any so rotation, no rotation in the lattice. Factor. There yeah, is yeah, no okay. shear associated to that. Yeah. It's just uh, uh, you know the diagonal term of the strain tensor. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. So in that case, there is no rotation. So this is something which is compatible with the absence of seismic anisotropy in the low mantle. Uh, this can do the job whatever the grain size, so we don't have to, to have a constraint on the grain size. Uh, the, these are the strongest implications that, uh, that we could propose so far for this mechanism. Okay, so this is something, and again, I would like to, uh, to elaborate on the presentation of Uli. Now, this is, uh, this is Uli, who is standing on the other side, you can recognize him. And uh, he was pointing the, the possible role of uh, grand boundaries. And you know, we are here basically transported at the very beginning of my talk, because we have here uh, something, a grand boundary, for which we have a description at the level of crystallography. And that was exactly my first slide when I was just showing the unit cell of Bridgmanite. I mean, crystallography is not part of continuum mechanics. So if we apply shear to a crystal structure, if you apply free MPA to BBNM, you cannot tell the constitutive equation. So this is basically the kind of limitation that we had with grand boundary and to introduce grand boundary as an actor of deformation in, uh, in rheology. There are experimental indications that in some cases grand boundary play a role and they can be important and, uh, and the Kohlstedt group has highlighted very much the role of grand boundary sliding, so, so, so this is something that we, we need to consider. But we are lacking a theoretical description so far to, to do that. So can we do it? So this is something that we, we started a few years ago in collaboration with those uh, colleagues from MES, Claude Fressanjas and Vincent Aupin. Uh, again, I would like to, to, to remind you what we saw at the beginning of the week when we were building elasticity. So you start from a displacement field. You can see there's a gradient of that, and there is something that I forgot to, to write here, but which is kind of important. It was to, to realize that taking the, the gradient of the displacement, you can split it into two parts. The symmetrical part, which gives rise to the strain tensor, but there was another part which was asymmetric, which was the rotation part, and we saw that it was what was giving the rotation. And basically what we do, usually, the elasticity, is that we throw that away, and we continue like that by relating this symmetrical part, so this strain tensor, to the stress. We have uh, elasticity, the Cauchy stress, then the equilibrium, you will see that, and I will uh, then uh, uh, put it back. But this is something you may need to consider if you want to go further. This is a tensor which is asymmetric, which means that it has zero on the diagonal, and it has only three independent terms, because those are the same with a minus sign. So we can take those three components and build a vector with that. And that vector would be the rotation vector. So let me just now show the full elasticity. You know the displacement, then the gradient, then the deformation tensor, Hooke's law, then equilibrium condition, energy, whatever you like. So what we can do is we can take this asymmetrical part of the distortion tensor. With that, we can build a rotation vector, which can be an exact equivalent as the displacement. So you, have, you would have the translational part and the rotational part of the, of the strain, if you like. And with that, you can imagine to build exactly the same thing. You could say, well, uh, we have a, a vector. Let's take the gradient. That would describe, that would be a tensor, of course, that would describe the curvature of the material. And then, of course, this curvature would be the result of torques, of moment of coupled stresses. So we would couple here with a rigidity tensor the coupled stresses with the curvature. We can look for the equilibrium of that. Well, basically, you can do exactly the same kind of elasticity. What is important is what is coming next. <coughs> 
forget about the right part so far. Uh, then uh, we have to make the distinction between elasticity and plasticity. Elasticity is the nice world where everything goes well, where you have very regular fields. Everything would be as nice as that, smooth functions. So basically, you can take a gradient of that. And since you have a gradient, you know that the curl of a gradient is null. So to, to show that you have regular elasticity, we call that compatibility. This is not compatibility for geochemists. Sorry about that. This is a word different. But what we call here compatibility is that when you have a field which is regular enough, which is smooth enough, so since it's a gradient, the curl is zero. What happens if you have defects? If you have defects, well, uh, you have problems uh, sometimes. I don't know. You may have something. Something like that, a discontinuity somewhere in the field, for instance, in the displacement field. In that case, it's not a gradient anymore here. So the curl would not be zero. So you could use, uh, sorry, <laughs> I wanted to, to monitor the screen with my pointer, but it doesn't work. So you could use the curl as a measurement of the deviation with compatibility, again, not for geochemists. So, if you calculate the, the curl here of the distortion tensor, this is a measurement of the amount of, let's say, dislocations. And we can know that because if we build here, uh, this is how we, we calculate that. It's not very convenient, but it works. You know, if, if you make a closed circuit along, uh, around a, a defect, if you would do the same after but without the defect, you would have a closure vector. And the closure vector is a measurement of the defect. It's a measurement of the Burgers vector. So if you, if you do that mathematically, basically, you find what we call the Burgers vector. The Burgers vector of the dislocation can be found by the closure vector of a circuit around the defect. Let's do that exactly the same with this rotational part of elasticity. We should have a curl which is zero if we have compatible elasticity. But if we have other kind of defects, we may have a residue here. And the residue may give another vector. The name is the Frank vector. And that would be another kind of defect. And remember, remember that. Vito Volterra, 1920. These are those defects that are named disclination, they were already proposed theoretically by Vito Volterra in his original paper from the 20s. And he was always considering, already considering, the possibility of translational defects, which became popular as dislocation, and rotational defects, which became completely forgotten as disclinations. Not completely, people in, in uh, liquid crystals, they use disclination a lot because they have weak materials. We did consider, usually, that well, it was not useful. But, but in fact, they may, be. they may be. The question is that you don't believe in what you don't see. And we didn't have a way to observe this location. I go to the TM, I see this location. I go to the TM, I don't see this clination. Why? Because I'm not sensitive to rotation uh, components. But EBSD is sensitive to orientation. Electron backscattering, uh, electron backscattering diffraction. This is you, you put you put an electron beam on a material, and you make it diffract, and basically you measure precisely the orientation locally. So this means that at any point of your crystal, you have a precise measurement of the orientation. Realize that usually it's meant, it's used to look at the different orientation between crystals. But if you do that with high resolution, and if you realize that between those two points, M1 and M2, you have a slightly misorientation. This misorientation, the gradient of it, is a major of the curvature tensor. So this curvature tensor that we usually ignore, it does exist, and we can measure it. And the good point is that if we put that into the theory before, we have a mistake here. It's IK, the, the third A does not exist. <coughs> but if you put that into the formalism before, 
from the high resolution measurement of these orientation maps, you can get the curvature tensor and you can go to what we call the nigh dislocation density. So that is to the local distribution of dislocations and also to the disclinations. Do I have time? Maybe <clears throat> just about, just to show that it works, let's start with something we know, dislocation. We don't need that to look at dislocation, but you can look at dislocation. This is uh, an olive in sample <coughs> which has been deformed. And we can recognize the structure that people are used to see, like subgrain boundaries inside the grain. We can make this kind of measurements of the night tensor. And I'm sorry here, I will mostly speak to people who know about olivine, but I'm short of time. Uh, if, we, if we reconstruct the night tensor along the grain, subgrain boundary, we see components which correspond to 100 zero, zero glide. We see components that correspond to zero. 0, 1 glide, but those who would correspond to 0, 1, 0 glide in purple here, they are basically in the noise, there is nothing. And this is something that people know in the deformation of olivine. There exist 1, 0, 0 dislocation. There exist 0, 0, 1 dislocation, but no 0, 1, 0 dislocation. This is a way to get a little bit of confidence in this kind of measurement. Let's go to the disclination now. Oh, they appear. If we do this treatment, if we calculate the, like the curl of the curvation tensor, we do see at the grain boundaries mostly dots which are the disclination density. So that is the measurement, remember, of this closure vector of the rotational part of the uh, displacement. So we do see dots, blue and red, because they are positive and negative, but they decorate the grain, the grain boundaries. We see them at different scale. There are issues. It's EBSD measurement. We don't have access to all components of rotation, so we don't have access to all the disclinations. Well, OK, we have some. A very important point is that disclination were forgotten because people said, well, that's too energetic. You know, the cost is too high. It could not exist in, in crystals. But what we forgot is that if you have a dipole, plus and minus, then basically the energy cost of a dipole of disclination is very equivalent to a dislocation or to an edge dislocation. So this means that it can come into the game. And here, we, uh, since we don't see all the disclination, it's difficult to really convince ourselves that we have dipoles. So we did a statistical measurement of the, the, the wide map that we have that we, on average, have the same amount of positive and negative disclination so that the idea of disclination dipoles makes sense somehow. Very fast, another way to look at that is to calculate it. We have many calculations of grain boundaries, and this is what you, you showed in your picture. Can we use that to bridge the atomic scale and the continuum mechanics? That has not been done much. I think it's, it's really important. But it's possible, because at atomic scale, we have the position after and before relaxation, so we know all the displacement. So you know all the equations I was showing. You can build everything because we know all the atomic positions quite accurately. So from that, we can build the displacement, the dislocation density, the rotation, the disclination density, and so on and so forth. So this is something we tried to do. This is uh, Xiao Yu Sun who did that. Uh, he, he did that first in, in this paper on a, on a subgrain in copper to demonstrate the, the technique, and then we applied that to this grand boundary, not exactly the one you were showing, but it's from the same paper calculated by Sandro Yan and uh, Ajaud. So starting from the crystallography, the motif, if you like, of the disclination, but then we can work out the field. This is, for instance, the deformation field, the component uh, E23, uh, for instance. Olivine is a little bit more complicated. We have different sublattice, oxygen, magnesium, silicon. We can make the calculation for, for, for all. I will not show everything. What I would just like to focus is here, omega, the rotation vector. And what do you see? You see that across the boundary here, over less than uh, one angstrom, or maybe two angstroms, you go from positive rotation to negative rotation. So this is a discontinuity. This is exactly what breaks the compatibility, and this is the reason why you don't have a curl. So you have a discontinuity in the rotation, and this translates into a dipole of disclination that we can have. So now we can really 
from uh, atomic scale calculation reveal the disclination that are inside, actually, that we didn't see, but that, that are inside. But what is nice is that now we are in the field of continuum mechanics. So now we can do, you remember this pile, this uh, pitch and curl force, a dislocation will respond to a stress. A disclination will also respond to a stress. This is not the pile, the pitch and curl force, this is an equivalent. But now if we apply if we shear, for instance, a boundary which contains uh, disclination dipoles, they will feel the stress, they will move, and when they will move, they will produce shear. And they will produce shear at the grand boundary. So this is, if you like, a regularization of the grand boundary sliding because this occurs over a distance which is a few nanometers. It's not much. If you look that from far above, you would see a grand boundary sliding. But uh, well, this is the very beginning of this work, and I don't know exactly where we're going. There's a lot of things, you know. Uh, dislocation started in the in the 30s. Uh, disclinations they have a long way, a long way to go. But I think that it's a very promising way to reintroduce grand boundaries in the field of mechanics. And uh, that's my final stop. And I thank you for your patience. Um, there's a lot of you know, complexity in looking at the grain boundary disclinations, but backing way off to the rotation tensor, it seems to me if you, we know the crystallography of our defects with respect to the elastic constants, then all we need to understand the relationship between our seismically observed anisotropy and uh, stress is simply the relationship between the rotation vector uh, or the rotation tensor, which is, I guess, a vector, a rotation vector and our anisotropy tensor. And that seems that we, you know, we, we, we need plastic models or flow models to tell us the extent of anisotropy or how much a certain amount of flow results in a certain amount of rotation. But to get the directions, you know, just that relationship, it seems like we have everything that we need from the crystallography. And so the question is, is what defines that orientation relationship between the rotation tensor and the elastic tensor of a crystal? And can we just simply plot that out and use that information? I think that there are several questions in, inside. Uh, this disclination business is not necessary to describe seismic anisotropy at all because then you describe a static configuration. You know? So you have a configuration and then you calculate the implications when a seismic wave goes through. So it's not at all the purpose of this story. The purpose of this story is to say, well, okay, we have an aggregate and so far the calculation I was showing was just considering an aggregate a rock, if you like, as just an assemble of grains which have their life independently somehow, you know. And to consider that the boundaries were just boundaries, just, uh, well, from that place to that place, you need to go from the description of that grain to that grain. But they were not something which could produce strain and contribute to some part of the constitutive equation. And the, the goal of this approach is to work this aspect only. Okay, so now is there a relationship in between the A tensor and the C tensor? No, uh, the A tensor has to be determined uh, on itself. But there is a relationship between the two. That's no, both are related to the bonding, but they are not related There's together. we know the crystallography of the defects. What, what are you speaking about? Uh, are you speaking about the, the tensor I was showing, which relates uh, moment forces? The, the rotation the tensor the rotation tensor relates the which stress direction tensor? with the rotation direction to dislocate due to dislocations. I know this is a description of the rotation of the grains, a static That's description. Right. That's right. <laughs> and so we know the relationship yeah, yeah. we know the crystallographic relationship between the exactly. If you measure it, you have the answer. You, you describe the kinematics of your of your system, Absolutely. and you don't have uh, you, you don't have always. And uh, hopefully, that's good. You don't have always to describe the full dynamics to to, to model the kinematics. 
But we don't need to understand the full dynamics in order to no. be able to connect no. the observed anisotropy directly to the except uh, except except if processes occurring at the grain boundaries are major actors in how the grains rotate. In that case, we would have, but this has to be proved. And I don't know. Uh, what is the interaction between dislocations and disclinations then at the grain boundaries? And I'm also thinking about subgrain boundaries, right? So you showed how um, dislocations accumulate internally mm -hmm. form these subgrain boundaries. How does that then relate <coughs> to this? I cannot. Uh, I cannot tell more. Uh, the, the the Russian group who has worked uh, recently, Romanov and. and uh, they, they have proposed several kind of complex reactions between uh, disclinations and dislocations. Um, I don't know exactly. But I think that we, for the moment, we are more focusing on the disclination in the grand boundary than on the disclination inside the grand. There are a few, but it doesn't seem to be so much now. Uh, to try to answer more specifically to, to your question, this is something I cannot answer yet because this is not something that we have clarified and uh, we are working actually on a, a more elaborate model than the one yet you can see. But uh, the, the black contours that you see here are related to the emission of shear components, which would be fractional dislocations apparently. So there is an interplay in between the dislocation, not the dislocation, but the fractional dislocation and disclinations. But uh, well, this is really something we, um, we are just starting to, to, to work out and to understand, so I don't have much to, to tell now. But there are, there are potentially uh, uh, possibilities of having transfer from one to the other. There has been some description, for instance, uh, if, if you, if that was the, the question of Abby last time, if you have a subgrand boundary which is irregular, for instance, or a subgrand boundary that stops into the crystal, not a grand boundary as you showed, but into the crystal, you would have to describe the tip by a disclination, for instance. So uh, if you have subgrand boundaries which are not equilibrated with this regular spacing that she was referring to, in that case, you would need to add some disclination component to describe that, for instance. So in the end, could you get to subgrain rotation recrystallization? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I think that for subgrains, we have dislocation and we don't need the disclinations. Uh, per personally, you know, I would not. I think that it's worth for, for the uh, uh, large misorientations because this is where we don't have any uh, model to describe. So this is where we, we tend to focus. It, it's not impossible, but I'm not sure that it will help much. We, I think that we have enough. I don't know. Okay, I think we should uh, uh, take a break. So let's, let's thank... Uh,